So um, today we're going to talk about um, social life and so with my strangely propped up um, phone um, I have got some notes on the screen and I've got some notes on paper. So um, I'm going to take you through um, what to do about social situations and I always find this um, a really fascinating issue. I On the back of one of our booklets I've uh, got a saying which is that we get pissed together so why should we get sober alone and everyone loves it they go oh yeah that's absolutely true but then I say well actually it's not true because mostly we drink alone we may drink when there's someone else like our partner in the room but generally it's not about big social lives most people who are over drinking like we are um, it's become actually part of our daily routine and most of our drinking we do at home so one of the things I want to do today is to explore some of those myths that we've created um, around our social life and our social drinking and begin to break some of them down. Because just like everything else um, around our drinking, those myths have stuck very strongly in our brain and they're really hard to dislodge. But once you realise they're myths, then actually um, you begin to free yourself from what those myths entail. So like I said... Um, we have really, um, um, social situations are difficult without a doubt and there are two reasons why they're difficult. The first is because um, there are other people around who may persuade you and encourage you to drink or people that you've used to be drinking with. So you've got external um, influences trying to change your drinking. You've also got your internal stuff going on. Well, I always normally drink when I'm out with so-and-so and it gives me confidence and I can't talk um, with strangers without drinking and um, and um, I'm nervous and it might be boring so I could really do with a drink because it would be boring and all of this sort of stuff going on. So you've got loads of internal um, triggers going on and the combination together is like a gift to your internal saboteur. It's basically going, whoa, bring it on, I've got extra leverage, I'm just gonna nail this, and by the time you get to the party and the first person says to you, oh, do you want a glass of champagne? You're just gonna cave in because you've got so many external and internal triggers going away at once. And actually, that's really important for you to know that what you've got is a ton of different stimuli that are all feeding into your internal saboteur. And so basically thinking through your social situations, planning your social situations, understanding some of the myths will really help you blow that apart and begin to get your internal saboteur under control. But let's reflect on what being social really means to you. We all think we're incredibly social, which we are, because talking to another person is being social. We all need social sim stimulation, otherwise um, we end up being very insular, we can end up being very depressed. We need other people to talk to, share ideas with, come to a common understanding, um, you know, be part of a tribe. It's a very natural thing to do. Um, but... And, and actually, we do it naturally every day. We do it naturally at work. We do it when we say hello to somebody on the bus. We are actually naturally social without alcohol. But what's happened over time is both society and ourselves have created some myths that mean that we, we actually give alcohol some magical properties. It has magical properties that make us more social, more able to go out, more talkative and sometimes that we think that doing those things is impossible without alcohol and that's really not true so like i said um we often think that we are um when we come to talk about changing our drinking a lot of people say to me oh but i don't want to give up my social life and of course you don't a you don't want to and nor should you because being social is really important but um, what you do is you begin to put that as a barrier to you changing your drinking. But if you really sat down and wrote down how many times you go out and do something big and social, this isn't sitting in front of the telly drinking, this isn't sitting with your partner drinking over dinner, this isn't, you know, those, those occasions which are really domestic that you are counting as social, but those times where you go out to the pub with a group of people or you go to a restaurant with a group of people or you go to a wedding or a party, I suspect you probably don't have more than two of those events per month. Even when, I'm, I mean, I had quite a lot when I was drinking. I don't have children. I live in London. It was easy to get everywhere without drink. But I manufactured most of those occasions to go out and drink in the pub 
after work. If I really thought about those social occasions that were important, very few of them, very few. So actually being social isn't about um, losing lots and lots of sudden things in your life. It's about rethinking two or three or four, or maybe if you go out once a week, five occasions um, uh, uh, a, a month that are important to you, that involve lots of other people. So stop seeing your drinking social life as all of the same thing and begin to segment them. Actually, these are days that I go to the pub because I need an excuse to go to the pub and these people always go to the pub after work, but they're not the social situations that I really enjoy the most. These are the things that I do where I'm meeting people, I'm meeting family, I'm meeting friends. These are things that fill me with joy, that give me satisfaction of spending time with people I really like. Those are the social situations that I want to have a little talk about today. But it's really important for you to be able to divvy them up and say, well, actually, if I look at this, many of the situations that I'm frightened of losing are the situations where I manufacture because I want to go and have a drink anyway. Um, and they're not actually the things that are the most important to me. And that's not unusual for us to do um, because, you know, alcohol has taken a huge grip on our lives. We wouldn't be here if it hadn't. You wouldn't even be considering changing your drinking if um, you weren't sort of unhappy about the way it has has basically seeped into every aspect of your life and it may be that you begin to realize that in the in the past few years the social life social events that you've been to be they the drink after work in the pub or you know big events like weddings and parties you might have been enjoying them less because you drink too much you black out you have hangovers, you don't remember what was said the night before, you feel groggy for up to three days afterwards. So really, were they all that special? Were they all that good? Were you really enjoying them as much as you thought? Were they just a sense of a good night rather than a good night that you remember that you can think about for weeks afterwards? Probably not. So again, not is it that uh, not only is it that that there aren't as many events as you think are that important, but also you probably manufacture some of those to excuse your drinking. And if you think in reality about what those social events were of all kinds in the last few years, you probably realise you enjoyed less of them because of the repercussions afterwards or that feeling of guilt and shame. So actually, what are you giving up? You're giving up some really terrible experiences. And what have you got to gain? Or well, what you've got to gain are going to those events that are really important for you and enjoying them in a way that you should, remembering them in a way that you should and connecting with people in the way that you should be. And I'll always come back to this thing that was really important to me, which is I always thought I was a social person. I am a social person. I'm an extrovert, right? I'm, if if there, there's a scale of extroversion, I'm right on the big old extrovert end, right? I, if, I don't spend, if I don't speak to a person for a whole day, I'm going mental. I really do go mental. I think while I'm talking, as if you can't tell, right? So I need people to talk to, to do all of those things with. So I always thought, right, I was a social person. And over time, in my 30s, began to think, well, maybe I'm not the social person I thought I was. I'm not the people person I thought I was. And it was a real um, real eye-opener to me once I gave up drinking and realised that the reason why I wasn't the people person, the social person that I thought I was, is because I was always too bloody tired and ashamed and self-critical and actually depressed because of the effects alcohol had on me to actually engage with people on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, being social isn't about the big party. It's the having a laugh by catching somebody's eye on the tube in the morning, having a small conversation with somebody um, in a shop, um, talking to people at work and engaging and taking some time to talk to them. That's where I get my energy from and it's amazing. So don't forget that you have to think about what being social is to you and not what society has told you that it should be because there's a lot of stuff about telling us, oh, we must be brilliant party people, we must be drinking champagne every night, standing around a pool. You know what? Fucking no one does that. Just the odd few people. And it's all designed in magazines to sell a shit, basically. So um, let's so reflect on what being social is to you, what the important people are in your life, what spending time with them means, what spending time at events that are important to them means to you, and not but about what society tells you, and not what that lovely little wine witch in your head tells you should be important. Um, 
But, um, so actually, if you really begin to unpick, what is it you're giving up exactly? You're giving up some shame, you're giving up hangovers, you're giving up parties that you don't remember. What have you got to gain? Well, quite frankly, guys, that's up to you. Because as you're changing your drinking, one of your little side projects that can distract you from, you know, those cravings that might be coming along is working out what joy is for you, what being social is for you. And you might not get it right first time. You might go to a few board game nights and realise that's not quite for you. You might go to a few salsa classes and decide that's not for you. But actually part of this journey is finding new things that make you feel social, make you feel joyous make you feel like you're connecting with other people um, so actually you've got everything to gain um, and um, oh, the Marmite jar is in front of some of my notes hang on a minute oh yeah and don't forget that your life hasn't been one like continuous party. You had loads of parties when you were in your the, in your twenties when you were a student. Actually, time's changed already. Your social life has changed already because as time moves on, you get more more responsibilities at work. You might have had children. You might have moved house. You might have had a mortgage. You might have fallen in and out of love countless times. Things have changed anyway. You can deal with change because you've been doing it. Sorting out what might your, be your new social life, your new social identity, is peanuts in comparison to all of that. So don't get your knickers in a twist about it. This is something you can do, and it is actually going to be quite painless, and actually you're going to enjoy it. So let's just burst some myths first of all. Right, you need alcohol to have a good time. No, you don't need alcohol to have a good time. Advertisers of alcohol tell you that you need it. And society has generally uh, perpetuated the myth because um, it allows us all an excuse to drink so that we can all partake in this, um, in, in, in social drinking. It gives us all an excuse. But in reality, you don't need alcohol to have a good time. There are many people who have a good time without alcohol. And in fact, once it's tipped into meaning that we've had a horrible day the day afterwards and we've got hangovers, it actually ceases to be worth the effort. It's actually a myth that you need alcohol to have a good time. You need to be with people you enjoy being with to have a good time. Um, that alcohol is the only way to celebrate success, you know, getting the champagne out. What a feat a marketing genius it is to say that, oh, a successful situation involves a popping of a cork. Now, that's not something that's been um, developed, you know, through our evolution through from Neanderthal times that we celebrate by popping a cork. It was clearly part of whatever the marketing was around champagne that says not only is this for special occasions because it's bloody expensive, but it pops a cork, it fizzes, you waste a fiver on the floor before you've even had a drink. So this idea that you can only celebrate something, only totally something with alcohol is is again complete bollocks and then the idea that you're refusing somebody's hospitality if you don't drink their really really expensive wine or their expensive champagne is also rubbish people should have invited you to an event because they want you there they want you to share the event with you they want to talk with you they might want to do business with you. They might, you know, want to give you business. But actually, they haven't invited you in order to get drunk. They've invited you for you, for who you are. And I think that's a really important thing to remember all the way through this. So I tell you these myths because they're really important for when you are trying to tame your internal saboteur. Um, and and that's because you need a bit of logic to be able to go, no internal saboteur, it is a special occasion, but it's only marketing that tells us that champagne is for a special occasion. For me, a special occasion is spending time with lovely people, drinking some fluids, eating some food, and then going home and remembering the evening, being able to reflect on it the next day and get up and do things that are important to me. That's what enjoying a social occasion is. Right, on to paper notes now. Highly unusual for me, people. Right. Um, uh, you also need to know those myths because you will um, begin to realise over time that you use those myths as an excuse to drink more. Oh, yes, it's a celebration. So I'm going to chug loads of Prosecco. I'm going to chug loads of wine because we're celebrating. And the only way to celebrate is to get completely wankered. 
no, that's all just a myth that you have now taken to an, an extreme, basically, and you've used it to justify drinking more on your own behaviour. So we, we need to do that. Um, the, understanding these myths is also important because they're quite hardwired. I was having a conversation with someone the other week about the fact that um, if I sit and look at the things that I eat on a daily basis, the things that I avoid and the things that I try and eat are all based on a concoction of about 25 diets I've done since the age of 15. So I, so at the minute I'm not on any specific diet, but whenever I go to eat something, um, it's based on some logic I've interpreted and picked up from a number of diets I've been on because somehow they've all lodged in my brain. And the same with alcohol is that all of those myths, all of those community creations about alcohol have stuck in your brain to allow you to, and we wanted them to as well, so they stuck there nice and hard, um, and 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 therefore they they are. You need to undo that hard wiring. You need to unpick those myths and recognise them for the untruths that they are. And as with everything with alcohol, it's about unpicking them. It's about being able to stop, recognise that this is a myth that you perpetuated because it suited your drinking goals. And now your drinking goals are different. You have to perpetuate a new one and remember what it is. So that's the other really important part of that. The, that means there's some good news, folks. That means that over time, things will get easier. And I will. Um, it, it was always amazing to me that point when I did at social situations feel really awkward with it, without an alcoholic drink in my hand for probably the first three or four months. And then about a year in, I thought, ah, oh, I am witty and amazing and having a great conversation with this person in the way that I always used to when I was drinking. And I hadn't noticed that actually something had switched um, and I no longer felt self-conscious. And that's what it is, it's self-consciousness. It's not a need, it's a self-consciousness. I no longer felt self-conscious. I never felt anxious about talking to people anymore. And in fact, it was a bit like a broken limb at some point after having the cast taken off and all of that sort of stuff, things were better. And I don't remember at which point that switched, but it does. Which means that every social event you encounter from now on is an opportunity to practice. And the more you practice dealing with social situations, the more they will become to feel natural without alcohol. Like all of those people at parties that don't drink that you never noticed before because it wasn't convenient to you will become one of those people that feels comfortable. So I want you to know that by unpicking and taking time to do that, you can do this. But that doesn't mean there aren't going to be situations that don't try you, be they weddings, be they funerals. Bizarrely, we feel the only way to commemorate somebody's demise is to do something really unhealthy to our own body. Yeah, yeah, somebody's died of a heart attack, obesity, underage. La, la, la. I know what, let's get completely wankered with a poison to, to celebrate their life. Ah, what sort of weird logic is that? So um, you need to be able to deal with those situations. And so um, understanding the myths is only one part of that. A big part of it, just like everything else, is planning and having a whoop, a wish, an outcome, an obstacle and plan. And I've talked about these quite a lot through... Um, through different parts of club soda and how you go about changing your drinking and so I'm going to apply those here so it doesn't matter let's say for example you've got a wedding coming up um people don't seem to invite me to weddings it might be about a number of articles I wrote about <laughs> why marriage isn't compulsory I think it really diminishes the wedding invites I've had um but anyway if I were to go to a wedding and I was at the early stages of changing my drinking, or even now actually, we can talk about that, then I would want to go with a plan. And my wish would be to go to a wedding and, um, and not get drunk. And by not getting drunk, I will um, not only feel good about myself that I managed to navigate a social situation without drinking, and that I've got another social situation under my belt, which will make each one of these easier, but I will also have remembered the whole event and be able to wake up the next day and enjoy the luxury hotel that I've probably paid several hundred pounds to be in or enjoy um, some time with my family the day after such a hectic day. Whatever your outcome is, 
make sure you articulate it. Make sure it's something you're passionate about. Make sure it's something you really want to happen. So my wish is to not get totally drunk at a wedding. The outcome I'm hoping for is to have a lovely day the following day, enjoying the beautiful surroundings that I find myself in. Maybe get in the pool, beat Jim, uh, Jill a bit more at swimming. That sort of thing. So what might the obstacles be? Well, the obstacles will be where well, there'll be a free bar, it'll have free-flowing um, alcohol, that somebody will be continually topping up the glasses, that there'll be people who um, will be asking me what I want to drink at the bar and I'll have to say something non-alcoholic and I'll feel awkward about it. There'll be strangers there that I've never met before and I'll have to introduce myself. All of those things will be going on in your mind. But that's okay. Knowing your obstacles means you can plan for each of them. So what are you going to do about the free-flowing bar? Well, first of all, you can actually be active about your own health. First of all, you could... Uh, I always RSVP now and say, I hope there's something interesting and non-alcoholic um, as one of my dietary requirements. <laughs> it's great. But if you're really stuck, you could take your own. And there are many different types of weddings that so maybe if it's got a cash bar you might want to phone up the bar and ask if they've got a corkage fee there's certainly members who have done that and, and phoned up in advance brought their own alcohol free wine put it in the chiller and they charge them 50 pence every time they had their own glass perfect what a better way to do it you may decide that you can't quite do that but you might be able to take a small bottle of cordial with you so you can pimp your own water for the whole day perfect you might even take several different flavors so you can knock yourself out but you know there's nothing stopping you doing that there's nothing stopping you doing what one of our members did and just take their own drink anyway in their bag and just make sure they were topped up if you're staying in a hotel where the event is at then actually you can put some stuff in your room in your own fridge so that can be part of your plan part of your plan might also be taking time out you don't have to participate in every minute of every event. Um, I used to think I had to. I would even be really quick in the loo because I thought people would miss me. And quite frankly, when people are drinking, A, they don't miss you. And B, my haste wasn't about other people missing me. It was so I could get back and drink more quicker. Now I'm quite happy to take time out of events, go for a walk around the block, um, go and take a walk in the gardens and the surroundings, um, even take a little bit longer in the loo and just, you know, give myself some restorative time because as much as I think I'm an extrovert sometimes you need to step back reflect about where you are in order to know how you're going to carry on the rest of the evening the other important thing is is definitely if it's a difficult family situation like you might not enjoy being at the wedding but you have to be there because it's a family thing the time out is really really important for you so that you can stay the distance at something you're not enjoying now, generally, I would tell you that if you're not enjoying something, you should go. Um, and if you don't think you would enjoy something, you shouldn't go to begin with. Because what, what sort of bizarre world we live in that we drink in order to stay at something that we don't want to be at, uh, that we're not enjoying. Treat yourself with consent and go, no, actually, I'm not enjoying this. I'm going home. But if you can't, then taking some time out will allow you to do that. Part of your plan might also be about thinking in advance about who else will be there. Oh, Andy Gladys is, is going to be there. I haven't seen her for ages. I wonder if she might have some great stories about my mum, my uncle, my grandmother, whatever. It would be really nice to spend some time talking to them. In fact, um, you can make other people's event better by taking time to seek out people that you may never have met before that are now a new part of your family or friendship group or people that you haven't spoken to for a while and taking some time. Some of these events, guys, there is no rush. So why do you need to rush? Why don't you take some time to talk to some people you've never done before? Um, the other is to plan some questions that you might want to ask people that you've never met before. Oh, so how do you know the bride and groom or the party girl or boy or whatever is a really common one? Just go for it. You know, you remember when you were at university, if you went to university and you asked, you know, what A-levels did you have? Where did you go to school? All of that sort of shit. Well, those questions are there for every occasion. They're just different. How do you know the bride and groom or what brings you to this party? How do you know some of the people here? Um, I really like the dress you're wearing where did you get those shoes it's not one that I ask very often to be fair um, you know you can ask people at my brother's wedding where I wasn't drinking I took my own tea but I also went up to lots of his friends who I'd never met before and asked you know how they got to know Paul was it through golf was it through when he was dossing around at university 
or was it from something else, you know? I met my, my brother's partner's family who I didn't know very well and I talked to them. But I also spent a lot of time with my grandmother who is very old and I knew it would be more enjoyable for her if I could spend some time talking to her because she's not very mobile. So, you know, sometimes an event's about bringing joy to other people, not expecting them to bring joy to you. So that can all be part of your plan and it doesn't matter what that situation is. Then the final thing you need to plan is what to say when somebody says, do you want a drink or what do you want for the toast? And say it out loud, say it out to, the, to a mirror so that you can hear your voice saying it. Remember when I said a couple of weeks ago, the most influential voice for you to hear is your own and say, actually, I'm not drinking today. If you feel you need to add in an excuse, and you don't have to, not by any means, you could say, because I've decided I want to enjoy the whole evening because I've got some stuff I want to do tomorrow morning. You can add something in if you like, but be bold, be proud in your statement. Um, and when they come around to top up your glass, feel happy to put your hand over the top and say, actually, have you got something non-alcoholic? But don't let them take your wine glass away. You want your non-alcoholic drinking that wine glass still. You don't want a tumbler with a straw in because you're not five. And feel free to tell them that as well. I might do that often. So stop thinking about social events as things that are outside of your control. They are so within your control. You can beat back the myths and all those internal things that will, will come up to, to, to swirl around in your mind to put you off course. But you can plan and you can plan for these events and make them what you want to be. The other important part is to make sure that you've got a reward for yourself at the end of the evening. That reward is not alcohol, just so you know, right? So if you've managed to get through the event without drinking, how are you going to reward yourself when you get home? Is it by going a little bit earlier and watching a, a episode from a box set? Is it about having a hot chocolate? Is it about having sex, you know, in your luxury hotel room? Is it about I don't know where you get the sex from, but you know, it might be possible. Um, is it about um, um, having a bath before you go to bed? Is it, you know, whatever it is you feel will be a reward for you, do it and go, you know what, I'm giving myself a big pat on the back. And not only that, it will give you something to look forward to throughout the evening. And that could work for you, whether you're doing drinks on a Friday with your colleagues after work, or it could do you for the big wedding. The size of the event doesn't matter here. For me, they are all these things that are all messed together with a, everyone's expected to drink. Um, and so how am I not gonna drink events? And that's how they are. Um, don't always offer to drive, by the way, because if you do, you might end up having to stay as long as the people who are drinking are. And by that point, you may be really, really, really bored. Trust me, staying to half past 12 with loads of pissed people and then driving them home is not fun. So make sure you've got your own exit plan. The other thing to do is to plan something for the following morning that you feel you really want to do and that you would really regret not being able to do. So you can say to yourself, if I have a drink now, then what I'm saying no to is getting up and having a lovely walk in the morning. What I'm saying no to is getting up and having a lovely brunch and reading the papers. What I'm saying no to is getting up early with my um, son and going for a bike ride. Whatever it is that you've got the following morning, you'll be able to say that to yourself. If I say yes to a drink now, this is what I'm saying no to. I'm saying no to my bath when I go to bed and I'm saying no to this tomorrow morning. And you don't want to say no to those things. The other thing is to make sure that you've got an exit plan as well. So if you're really, really not enjoying something, know how you're going to get away from it. And it may be just putting yourself into another room and being quiet, going into the kitchen, doing some washing up and doing a chore to, um, to alleviate the boredom and get everyone out your face. Um, actually, one of the nicest parties I did before I gave up, I was so desperate not to be drunk at it, um, that I spent the evening clearing, um, topping up people's glasses and clearing away plates for my friend's 70th birthday. And I felt so good because A, I didn't ruin his party by being too drunk, but I actually also made his party by um, relieving them from the need to do any of that. And in fact, it made their evening. So that, God, can you imagine how that makes you feel? God, amazing. So find yourself a task to do if it's something you can't escape from. Find somebody new to talk to that looks like they might be a bit bored too and discover something new about somebody. 
you know, um, and and find those exits with other people by getting out the room and deciding you can go home or by doing something else at the event. But you can have an exit plan. Lock yourself in the toilet for half an hour. Nah, that might annoy some people, depending on the party, but who knows? So, um, so you know, all of those things, um, the better you plan, the more likely you are to succeed. Um, and the more you plan in rewards for yourself for succeeding, the more you'll begin to unpick that hard wiring. And trust me, over time it gets easier. Just like combating your internal saboteur, the more you practice, the better you will get, the more relaxed you'll feel in social situations. And quite frankly now, it doesn't bother me that I'm not drinking, because not only do I feel that I will talk to people that I want to talk to, but I then don't um, embarrass myself later on when I've got too much drink and I also don't have to deal with other people's repetitive conversations after they've had two drinks either. Um, I follow up, um, particularly at work things, I follow up everything really quickly um, so I feel a great sense of satisfaction that I'm progressing club soda further in some ways um, and all in all I wake up without a hangover the following day so any misery I feel is all my own. God. Because guess what? Not every day is perfect. Cool. So that's it. That's social situations. And I know you probably wanted me to go through each type of social situation, but really they are all the same. They are all events where they've created a myth that only alcohol will make this party um, happen. And actually that's a myth that you're going to be blowing away event by event over the next six months to a year as you try out your newfound superpower. You won't be able to tell, but I went to see Wonder Woman this week. Wonder Woman doesn't drink. Duh! Who knew? But apparently, uh, being able to do double somersaults and be able to do that with bullets and be able to crush cars with hands apparently relies on you being sober. So there we are. Let's do this, guys. All right, speak to you soon. Bye!